This episode is brought to you by Shopify. Do you have a point of sale system you can trust or is it <clears throat> a real POS? You need Shopify for retail. From accepting payments to managing inventory, Shopify POS has everything you need to sell in person. Go to shopify.com slash system, all lowercase, to take your retail business to the next level today. That's shopify.com slash system. Hello and welcome to Invisible Heat. I am Sadia Khan. And I'm Asad Bhatt. On Livernoy Avenue in Northeast Detroit, during the summer of 1975, 39-year-old Andrew Janarian spies three black teenagers tinkering with his car. They are in the parking lot of Bob Bolton's Bar and Grill, a primarily white bar that Janarian owns. He pulls out his 25 caliber pistol and aims at 18-year-old Obi Wen. Wen is hit in the back of the head and dies the next morning. Janarian is casually questioned and released on a meager bond. Wen's death incites riots across the Livernoy Fenkel neighborhood for two days. Stores are looted, fires are started, and bricks, stones, and bottles are launched at cars and people. On the first night of these protests, 54-year-old Marion Pisco is driving home from his job as a dishwasher at a bakery. He's a Polish immigrant and a Holocaust survivor. His car radio is broken, so he hasn't heard the news about the mayhem. While stopped at a red light, he is approached by about a dozen black youths. They extract him from the car and bludgeon him with a brick. He dies three days later. This is invisible hate. Welcome back to Invisible Hate, a weekly true crime podcast in which Asad and I attempt to uncover the ugly truths behind various hate crimes, both recent and historical. That's right. Many of the cases that we discuss involve crimes committed against minority groups. Our goal, as always, is to determine through a discussion of the nuances and complexities of these crimes, whether or not they can actually be considered hate crimes. Today's case appears to fit many of the criteria for a hate crime, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. Sadia, how have you been? I've been okay, I said. You and I have had these conversations. My family has been through something that I don't want to discuss here, but it's just made me feel really sad. And I feel like I'm looking at the world from a very hopeless lens mm, right oh now. No, I'm sorry to hear that. I'm not in a great place and yeah, I'm I'm trying to get over whatever we are dealing with, but I want to know more about you. I know you just mentioned you're traveling to LA, which is fun. I mean, I don't find traveling interesting, but you do. <laughs> so tell me about it. Why are you going to LA? Yeah, sadly, we're going to L.A. this week because um, my movie, Ramadan America, is showcasing at the University of Southern California. We're going to have uh, a showing there. Oh. And then I'm just going to meet up with some people from the cast and crew to kind of celebrate, you know, the accomplishments of the movie. So, yeah, if anybody's in L.A. and wants to see it, you're welcome to come by. And if not, definitely check out upcoming screenings uh, for Ramadan America at our website, RamadanAmerica.com. And sadly, it's, it's been great. We've been all over festivals and winning a bunch of awards. Oh, we got wow. an award for overall excellence. We got an award for, uh, you know, best web series, even though we're not a web series. And so, <laughs> yeah, it's been great to see the reception and excited for more and more people to see the movie. Absolutely. Yes. As I said before, it's a great movie. Guys, if you haven't watched it, please check it out. Asit, are there any links people can go and click on to watch it? Yeah. So as of right now, it's only at festivals, but we're sharing those festivals on our website. And then hopefully in the next couple of months, it will be on various streaming services on Apple and Amazon and all that kind of stuff. We're still working on distribution for that. So stay tuned. We'll definitely let you know where you can watch it. Oh, that's so exciting. So I said, should we get started? Let's get started. Yeah. 
Livernoy Fenkel is a lower middle class black neighborhood. Bolden's Bar is a bit out of place in the neighborhood, being a primarily white bar with a sign that says, and I quote, businessmen's luncheon entertainment, unquote, outside. It serves as a hangout for many white off-duty cops. This is already sounding so bizarre to me. I said, it sounds so 1970s. It's so interesting. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Depending on who you ask, Chenarian is either known as the neighborhood protector or a racist man who only allows black patrons in if he knows them already. Oh, interesting. He employs a door buzzer system to pick and choose who can come into the bar trying to be very exclusive and primarily white. To me, he pretty much sounds like a racist, but I don't know about other people. Obi-Wen is a young black man who grew up in the struggling neighborhood. He loves sports and guns. His large family basically lives across from Bolton's. In 1975, he is living in an apartment with his girlfriend, whom he grew up next door to, and her two-year-old daughter. On the night of July 28, Wynn stops by his girlfriend's parents' home for milk and cookies and to play with his German shepherd and then heads out. At approximately 8.20 p.m., Janarian is told someone is tampering with a car in Bolton's parking lot. Huh. Stealing cars and car parts is a common occurrence there, so Janarian goes out and sees Wen tinkering with his car. It's still light out. He says Wen then heads towards him, holding what looks like a gun, though sources later say it was a butter knife or screwdriver. We don't know. Wen sees Janarian with his pistol and starts to run away as Janarian braces himself and aims with both hands. He fires one shot, hitting Wen in the back of the head. Oh my goodness. Wen drops. A huge crowd gathers quickly. Wen's younger sister catches word and brings his girlfriend to the scene. His girlfriend says, and I quote, when I got to him, I got on my knees and started crying. I kept saying, Obi, talk to me. But his eyes kept rolling back and forth. His lips moved a little, but nothing came out. He tried to move his head, but couldn't. It just kept bleeding and throbbing, unquote. Just devastating, Sadia. I mean, what a... Again, we talk about this all the time, like in just a matter of seconds, it goes from not that it's benign, but, you know, something so simple to uh, murder. And, you know, he was running away and to get shot in the back of the head and draw, oh, just horrible. This is devastating, Asad, and horrible. You're right. I mean, look, he was running away. Chenarian could have let this go, but he didn't, right? right? And that's what really makes my blood boil because people just engage in these irrational, violent acts without even thinking the impact it could have on people and, as we always say, communities, right? I think that's right. But anyways, going back to the case, police arrive on the scene. Chenarian is held inside the bar for questioning making it seem to the growing crowd as if he's being protected, which is pretty messed up, right? There is a dead person and the police is trying to protect him. As those gathered outside start to become unruly, the police chief sneaks Chenarian out the back of the bar and takes him to police headquarters. Mm. Meanwhile, the mob is spreading and an up old street store is firebombed. Wow. People are upset. People yeah. are upset and... I can understand why they are upset, but again, I wish the focus were still OB. Oh, of course. Yeah, I think you're exactly right. Yeah. The number of rioters reported varies wildly from 300 to over 700. So we don't know what the exact number is. A large police force, some of whom are armed with riot helmets, nightsticks and tear gas, responds, but is told not to use deadly force. Hmm. Now, here's what really made my heart so sad, Asad. During this riot, Marion Pisco is pulled from his car, unprovoked and beaten by several teenagers. 
He's a small man, defenseless against the large crowd. He suffers multiple skull fractures, the left side of his face caving in. Doctors consider his condition too critical for surgery. Mayor Coleman Young, Detroit's first black mayor, commissions the police chief to gather as many black law enforcement officers as possible to be on the front lines. You know, this is very interesting to me. I don't know why he used this tactic. What was the logic behind it? What do you think, Asad? I think this is a common tactic that police forces use, depending on who the who's on the other side, is that, you know, maybe there's there's less likelihood of violence if, you know, a black person sees a, another black person on uh, the other side of of the line. Uh, you know, I don't know if that's true or mm. not, but I'm guessing that that's the logic, right? If you see someone that looks like you, you're maybe less likely to engage in violence. I don't know if that's true. You know, Salia, this this whole incident reminds me, uh, you probably, I don't think you were living in the United States at the time, but of the verdict after the Rodney King beating here in the States in the early 90s. It was a really seminal moment mm. in American history. And there also were riots in L.A. after the verdict and a, a white truck driver was pulled out of his car and beaten. I can't even remember if he was beaten to death or near death, but severely beaten during those riots. And um, that really is the only other riot of this type that I can think of in American history that has this kind of implication. So I'm really interested in this case and I can't wait to learn more. But I think let's take a quick break and then we'll come back and we'll hear more about the story. This episode is brought to you by Shopify. Do you have a point of sale system you can trust or is it <clears throat> a real POS? You need Shopify for retail. From accepting payments to managing inventory, Shopify POS has everything you need to sell in person. Go to shopify.com slash system, all lowercase, to take your retail business to the next level today. That's shopify.com slash system. Welcome back to Invisible Hate. So, Sadia, what happens next in this riot? So, as before I talk about what happened next, I do want to elaborate a little bit on why Young would do that. Now, according to sources, Young is eager to change the perception of the police department, right? He is a former auto worker who is both politically and street savvy and is keenly aware of the frustrations that many black residents have felt toward law enforcement. And to your point, that's why he uses this tactic to bring black law enforcement officers on the front lines. Mm, so what sort of frustrations? Unfortunately, the same kind of brutalization of people of color, Asa, that we've seen so much in the recent years. We've talked about it numerous times on this podcast as well. Detroit's primarily white law enforcement officers do not have a good track record with the black communities that they are policing. Ike McKinnon, one of the first black police officers in Detroit, shares a particularly disturbing account of his experience with police brutality in 1967. Take a listen. I was pulled over by two uh, Detroit police officers, um, and they were both white. And one guy, I remember, he had silver hair and a brush cut. And I had my uniform on, I had the shield on, uh, the two for the second precinct. And I said, police officer, and smiled. He had told me to get out of the car. And as I did so, uh, I again repeated, police officer. And he had his gun in his hand. The other officer had his gun. And he said, tonight you're going to die, and said, racial epithet. And thing, it was as if it was slow motion. And I could see, because under a light, I could see him start to pull the trigger. And as I said, it was a slow motion. And as I dove back into the car, he started shooting at me. But I dove into my car through the open door and um, hit the accelerator with my right hand and steered it with my left hand and sped out of there. So I said, imagine if this can happen to a police officer, what kind of treatment are ordinary civilians, black civilians subjected to, right? Totally, yeah. So given Detroit's past, May Young is a huge advocate of a reform that he refers to as, and I quote, 
the People's Police Department, unquote. I mean, is there such a thing, I said? I don't know. I feel like that doesn't really happen. Yeah, I don't, I don't know enough about that kind of reform. I mean, I, you and I have talked about this and probably have somewhat differing opinion. You know, I think the vast majority of police officers are trying to do good. And there's uh, a small amount of, of people that are influential. But, you know, I think systemically there are things that need to change across police departments. And, and certainly I can imagine in the 1970s that there's a lot of you know racism that's there. Yeah, so talking about the People's Police Department, this involves community policing and more diverse officers. Now, Mm. you know, as you said, you and I have talked about this on numerous occasions. My problem is not with certain individuals. My problem is with systems. So even Mm -hmm. if you put diverse officers within that system of oppression and racial hierarchy, you will get similar results. And hence, it's important to change the system from within. For sure. And unfortunately, a lot of people still focus on individuals rather than systems, right? So I think that's where the disconnect is. But anyways, going back to the story, black officers make up about 20% of the Detroit police force and nearly all are utilized in the 20 block radius cordoned off around Bolton's bar. Mm. Interesting. Officers are working long shifts to restore peace in addition to law enforcement. Mary Young recruits hundreds of church leaders and community organizers to join him in trying to quell the rioters. So his focus right now is on the rioters, right? Because he's trying to make sure that there is peace and I can see why he would do that, but it also shifts attention from the actual murder. You know, I think if you're in charge of a city, you're trying to put out fires. And I think people are going to feel unsafe because there are a lot of rioters that are out looting and setting things on fire. And I think that is definitely the biggest thing that you would want from your leadership is to to quell those those riots. Yeah. And then you can deal with the, the murder, the investigation and all that kind of stuff. You're right, Asad. So many of Detroit's prominent figures ride around in a flatbed truck and use loudspeakers to urge people to rely on, quote unquote, their own black elected officials to vote and pray rather than destroy their community. They speak with protesters about their justifiable anger. I like the fact that they approach protesters from a place of empathy and they recognize why protesters are angry rather than just dismissing their anger as unwarranted. So that's something that I think is a good step in the right direction. But I said, how do you feel about this hands-on approach? Yeah, hands-on approach, meaning that they're riding around and trying to talk. To, yeah, I mean, I think that's great. You know, I think that when this kind of thing happens, you need to have people that are representing the peace, you know, trying to talk to both sides uh, of what's going on and trying to restore some sort of, you know, calm. And we didn't see that here enough, I think, in Portland a couple of summers ago after the George Floyd mm. murder when there was, you know, weeks and weeks and weeks of unrest. And yeah, there was just so much anger and violence to the point where it was demonstrators against demonstrators against police. And like, at some point, I think people were just like, just let them, you know, hurt each other. And Mm. that's not great either. So at least from your telling right now, like, I'm really glad that these prominent figures are really just trying to get involved and be uh, a voice of reason and, and peace. So yeah. You're absolutely right, Asad. And sometimes the pent up anger is not as a result of one incident, right? It's because of years of racial discrimination. Oh, for sure. And mistreatment of black community. And I guess that's why it's so important to recognize where these protesters are coming from, right? Now, Asad, among other things, Mob also thinks that police may have shot wins. So back at Bolton's offices show the self-appointed leaders of the mob that the bar is empty and also dispel a rumor that police had shot when. Yeah, remember, this is the 70s. There's no Internet and you're just getting your news from radio or television or even the daily news. And so there's probably a lot of rumors like this that are you know, spreading about what happened and who was at fault and, and all that kind of jazz. Exactly, I said. And this is happening the same night. So by dawn, 
The crowds have dispersed and no shots have been fired. Meanwhile, a call center is set up where people can voice their complaints. By the next day, word travels that Chenarian has been charged with second degree murder and released on a $500 bond. Okay. The black community is irate at the charge and how low the bond was set. I said, come on, like $500? Yeah, I mean, I was expecting him not to be charged and that there wasn't going to be a bond. Oh, really? So I guess, <laughs> I guess, yeah, just based on kind of how the, the story was unfolding, I was assuming this was going to be another story of a white man getting away with a murder of a, of a black person. So, yeah, I mean, I guess I, I can understand why they were right. But I guess, you know, in this telling, I'm actually impressed that at least they, they charged him with something. They charged him with something, right. <laughs> now that night, a crowd of mostly young black men Again, Storm Bolton's bar. Chenarian has gone into hiding with his family and the bar is closed. Rioters start driving a car into the entrance of the bar in order to ransack it. Now they are just completely destroying the bar. Mayor Young arrives and stands on the hood of the car being used to break down the door, urging the crowd to go home. But someone throws an object at the mayor and he flees the scene. Writers breach the entrance, steal all the liquor and destroy much of the interior before more police officers arrive to protect the premises. Police do employ riot sticks and tear gas that evening, but again, no shots are fired. When using tear gas, officers disperse the canisters from 20 feet away rather than launching them into the crowd and risking injury. By midnight, the crowds have died down. So to me, it seems, Asad, at least up until this point, that they are trying to disperse the crowd without injuring anyone, right? Their tactics seem to be more like scare tactics than anything else. Yeah, and and I, I don't know if this is like typical riot quelling tactics that are taught, but it seems different than what I've seen in recent years with police engaging with riders. You know what, as I'm reading this, it also got me thinking that sometimes when these riots happen, they take away from the actual crime and, Mm. you know, the travesty of justice that happens, for instance, in this case, wins death and people, police officers, the media, everybody starts to focus on the rioters and the mob and try to paint them in a certain light. So sometimes it's also important to think how these actions can have an adverse impact on what we are trying to achieve, which is justice, right? Prevalence of justice, which doesn't happen in these cases. Anyways, by the end of the two days, in addition to the two deaths, 10 are injured, up to 100 are arrested, and tens of thousands of dollars in damage are incurred. Mm. Many of those arrested for protesting have their bail set at the same amount as Janarian, which is $500. Oh, wow. Yeah, (laughs) that's very telling. Yeah. Uh, Sadi, what was the reaction to the crimes across the city? As we mentioned, there are two tragic victims in this case. Now, Detroiters seem to sympathize along racial lines, right? With either Wen or Pisco, depending on their own race. Pisco, a World War II veteran with a wife and two sons who had survived a Nazi concentration Mm. camp, was certainly blameless, right? And simply in the wrong place at the wrong time. But his case is investigated in a very different way than Wen's. Police go full force on finding Pisco's killers while barely giving Chenarian a slap Mm. on the wrist. So we can see the difference, the dichotomy that exists, right? Supposedly, there is evidence of tampering on Chenarian's car and the Detroit Free Press newspaper says Chenarian was just defending his property. Yeah, I hate that defense, but yep. Many witnesses, however, claim that Wynn was only sitting on the car in question and talking with a girl when Janarian approached with the gun and shot him while fleeing. Whoa, yeah, that's a lot different than trying to steal the car or do, doing even any sort of damage to the car, just sitting on the car. Wow, that's shocking. Okay. Now, Wynn is criticized for his past petty theft charges and run-ins with police. Janarian is excused for two past incidents with guns. Now, 
think about it, Asad. When has had some run-ins with police, which we are not excusing. But at the same time, when you look at Chenarian's past, he's had two incidents, right? One in 1964, when shots were fired outside a different bar he owned. And then in 1969, when he pointed a gun at someone. Mm. But he was never charged for either. In the media, Chenarian is rarely portrayed as violent, racist, or in with the police. Now, some even claim he was well-liked in the neighborhood and often played basketball with and hired black teenagers in the area. This is so messed up, I said. As I'm reading, I can see how media is creating this image of Chenarian versus when we've seen it time and again it's the same thing that happens over and over right as for the many shop owners affected by the rioting most do not appear too concerned and say they have no plans to relocate Mayor Young gets a lot of credit for restoring order he praises law enforcement for showing great restraint when provoked saying and I quote a new maturity has been formed in the relationship between the police and people. But he also has his dissenters, right? Those saying he's too concerned with the media representation and reputation of Detroit. Some news outlets call out Young and the shortcomings of liberal reform. Now, I said a lot of people in the black community see it in a very different light. They think that electing black leaders marked a huge civil rights win and a new reliance on using politics to effect change. But for the impoverished neighborhoods like Livernois Fenkel, circumstances remained brutal. Residents were over-policed and voices weren't heard through the democratic system. So there's a clear difference, a dichotomy that exists, right? On the one hand, you see black leaders in these positions of power, you see black officers, but on the ground, situation remains the same for a lot of people in the black community, right? So there's this clear difference that we can see. Totally. Also, the idea of community policing in Detroit, led by programs like Stress, which incentivized undercover cops to seek out conflict so they could arrest potentially, quote unquote, dangerous people and separate them from the rest of the society. This seems pretty messed up, I said. <laughs> yeah, you know, that is a different definition of community policing than I am aware of. So, yeah, that's fascinating. It pretty much seems like profiling to me, something that Muslims have also experienced. Yeah, we've seen it done with our community. Yeah, for sure. Still probably still happening. The fact that it's it was considered a form of community policing is really crazy to me. So Asad, for our listeners, can you talk a little bit about the history of Detroit before we move to what happened next? Yeah, Sadi, I think it's really important to talk a little bit about the history of Detroit as it relates to this case. So the deadliest of all urban riots in the 1960s actually occurred in Detroit in the summer of 1967. It started after police raided an unlicensed bar and someone threw a brick through one of the squad cars. Over four days, 43 people died, over 7,200 people were arrested, and over $64 million in damage was done. These riots were provoked by the deindustrialization and desegregation in schools, contributing to further segregation. And basically, Sadia, white flight had occurred leaving urban neighborhoods of now mostly black people neglected in terms of housing conditions, education, and social services. Professor and historian Frank Rashid, who is from Detroit and whose family businesses were looted in 1967, spoke of Detroit's economic downfall during that period. Here's a clip from a documentary on riots. The false narrative is that somehow the people of Detroit are responsible for Detroit's decline, and that 1967 is the centerpiece of that, that the people who rioted or who rebelled in, on the streets in 1967 were, are the people who brought about Detroit's decline, when the reality is that Detroit was in serious trouble from 19, from, since World War II um, because white folks were subsidized to move out of the city and the auto industry at the same time 
had decided to disinvest from the city. Wow, so that's something, right? And at the time of these crimes, unemployment rate is at a staggering 25%. Now, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission states, and I quote, many white companies are using archaic excuses for not finding quote-unquote qualified blacks, unquote, right? So there is a clear discrimination happening from neglected neighborhoods to um, many companies not offering jobs to qualified black applicants. But before we talk more about this case and what happened next, let's take a short break and then we will talk about the investigation and court cases. Welcome back to Invisible Hate. So, Salia, let's go deep into the investigation and what happened in the courts. So, I said, following the 500 bond that initially set off the second day of rioting, Tenarian is brought back into court and his bond is reset at 25,000. All the same, he pays the bond and is released. So, he still is able to pay the bond. He doesn't spend a day in jail and is allowed to reopen his bar while he awaits trial. I said, this to me is so bizarre. A person kills a young boy in the head. The kid dies and he is allowed to go back and, you know, carry out whatever he was doing before this incident happened. Like just do the normal life things. It is just bizarre to me. Yeah, I'm not surprised by it, but um, especially in the 1970s. Um, and even now, I, I wouldn't be surprised by it. But yeah, it is a little shocking for sure. Meanwhile, police have no leads on Pisco's killers. So they instead arrest any black man that could be tied to the location where Pisco died. Mm. Police charge Ronald Bell Jordan, James Henderson, Raymond Peoples, George Young, Dennis Lindsay and Douglas Lane with first degree murder. Oh my gosh, I said, this is so bad. Like the difference, the discrimination, the injustice is so in your face. Because remember, Chenarian was charged with second degree murder. They were all in the area that evening, though there is little to no evidence. Any are responsible and no witnesses that can or would tie them to the murder. So we don't even know if they committed this murder. That's interesting. Okay. Yet these six all had past minor run-ins with the police. So I think that's the basic criterion that they are using to arrest. It's said that the prosecution makes the arrests first and then works to build their case. Unlike Janarian, the six young men are held without bail at the notoriously disgusting and corrupt Wayne County Jail. One of the men, Dennis Lindsay, is able to obtain a lawyer and quickly gets his charges dropped. Oh, that's good. His lawyer, by the way, would later be pivotal in disbanding the stress program that we mentioned in the beginning. Oh, the one that has yeah, put undercover people in communities. Yeah, yeah, that's great. The remaining five men are dubbed the Livernois Five. The suspects, not to mention other inmates, are often beaten by guards and potential Witnesses are threatened with prison time or promised immunity. The Livernois Five Defense Committee forms which advocates for the men and sets out to prove they've been framed by police. Wow, this is also fascinating. The committee primarily raises funds for the defendants and awareness surrounding the injustices of the case. Sally, this kind of response seems really rare, especially in the 19. 19- 70s. Is that true? Absolutely, Asad. The two minors in the Livernois 5, Young and Lane, are finally released for lack of evidence and the exposed coercion of witnesses. So yes, there is some progress here, right? Subsequently, two court cases occur, which are described as the cause and effect of the two-day riots. Chenarians is first in January of 1976, he faces the potential of life in prison for second degree murder. Asad, honestly, I cannot get over the second degree murder part. 
His lawyers ask for a change of venue. Mayor Young, who ends up being a major witness in the trial, thinks it should remain in Detroit. Let's listen to his reasoning here. Chenarian is accused of murdering Obi Wynn outside his Livernois bar, an incident that triggered the two days of disturbances. The star witness, Mayor Coleman Young, who described the situation as a racial conflict and potentially explosive. He also claimed a change of venue would increase the feeling of unrest in the community. And I think the implications uh, behind a change of venue, namely that uh, it is impossible for any person, black or white, to get a fair trial in our city, which is evenly divided between black and white, and whose citizens have shown a remarkable uh, stability, maturity, and growing unity. Uh, I resent uh, any implication that the citizens of Detroit cannot be fair. The hearing before Judge Laster on the change of venue will continue tomorrow as attorney Neil Fink tries to prove his point that Andrew Chenarian cannot get a fair trial in Detroit. So, based on that, the venue is not changed. During the trial, Chenarian tells the following account of Wen's murder. He saw someone in his bar parking lot breaking into an Oldsmobile with a coat hanger. He asked the young man what he was doing, then pulled out his pistol and told the thief not to move. When Wynn started running, he fired in an attempt to make a citizen's arrest. It was meant to be a warning shot, but accidentally hit Wen. Chenarian only had vision in one eye, which would have made aiming difficult. His original story about Wynn charging him with an object now has completely changed. Mm. Still, speaking without emotion, Chenarian says, and I quote, I was scared. I thought he was going to fire a shot at me, unquote. After one week, Janarian is found guilty of the reckless use of a firearm resulting in death, essentially a high misdemeanor, and serves six months in prison plus three years under probation, along with a fee of 5300 After the verdict is announced, the prosecution makes statements indicating some sympathy for Janarian, raising some concerns about the fairness of the trial, Chenarian appeals, but the Michigan Court of Appeals upholds the conviction. He serves his time and moves to the suburbs. Yeah, you know, Sadia, I think that's just, uh, it's just so disgusting. You know, I think even his story, if it's true, as a gun owner, you have a responsibility for how to use it, right? To say that he was firing a warning shot, oh, and then it just hit him in the head. Like, you are then responsible for what happens, you know, with that gun. And the result was a dead human being. And for him to only get six months in prison is just uh, an injustice for sure. I said, absolutely. And look, if you have vision in one eye only, just don't use the gun. Don't use the fucking gun. Right. Call the police. Yeah. What do you do with the gun? Call the police. Yeah. (laughs) You're right. It's so messed up. Yeah. So what happened with the Livernois 5? So I said, as for the Livernois 5 trial, at that point, with just three remaining defendants, the trial ends in a hung jury. A second trial is held that results in a mistrial. In the third trial, with the strongest evidence yet of collusion between police and witnesses, the three remaining defendants are acquitted. The Livernoi Five had spent 11 traumatic months in custody. Their lives would be significantly changed by the injustice and costs of their legal battles. So imagine, Asad, on the one hand, this person who shoots someone in the head serves only six months in prison, while these five defendants, with no evidence that they committed the crime, are in jail for 11 months and put through this horrendous, horrendous experience. So yeah, that's the injustice that we still see to this day. Yeah. So Sadhya, what do you think? Do you think Chenarian committed a hate crime? Yeah, Sid. I mean, he was known by many to be a racist, right? We know that there is this racial tension in the neighborhood. It was light out. So he could probably see the victim and And above all, when was running away and not a threat, and yet he decided to shoot him in the head, right? So to me, it seems like, yes, there is probably some 
racial undertone to it. And if there is, then this will amount to a hate crime. Now, some may say, you know what, it was a car theft, which was common there. And there was supposedly evidence of tampering on his car and that he was blind in one eye, which is like, okay, don't use the gun if you are. And that he meant to fire a warning shot. But we've seen that he has this pattern of firing at people in the past as well. He had fired or aimed his gun at people in the past without killing anyone. But maybe this time he just was like, okay, maybe he went a step ahead and probably didn't care if this young black man was killed. We, we do this lower if Wynn was a white guy, would he have ended up dead or shot at? And I think the answer would be no, right? I think that Janarian would not have reacted that way, most likely, I think. I, I could be wrong, but I think that that's, you know, whether that would then rise to the level of being a hate crime, I'm unsure. I think it's more likely than not that Wynn is dead because of his race, right? And um, and so, yeah, that that to me, I think is the, the strongest indicator. But I mean, for me, Janarian, as I mentioned before, you know, you have a responsibility when you have a gun and uh, are using it. And there are multiple choices that he could have taken to allow for Win to still be alive today, right? 50 years later, could have called the police, could have just, you know, made a loud noise to detract him, could have done what he did and not fire uh, yeah. on the gun. You know, I think he felt entitled and knew that he could get away with it. He could get away with it, right. And that's horrible. And that's exactly what happened, Asad, right? He was in jail for only six months for killing somebody in the head while they were running away. So, Sadia, what's the latest? I mean, this happened like 50 years ago. So do you know anything that's happening now? Asad, we don't have any updates. But as you and I know, police brutality is still happening against young black men. We see it all the time. We hear news. Obviously, we thought that what happened to George Floyd was a racial reckoning unfolding in the US in 2020. But honestly, almost five years in, I think a lot hasn't changed. And I will say this again, I think we need to focus or refocus our attention to systems of oppression rather than individuals. And once we do that, things will get better. I completely agree with you. Yeah, I think that's very well said. Thank you, listeners, for spending this time with us. As always, if you have any questions or any thoughts, you can email us at info at invisiblehatepodcast.com. If you want to learn more about this particular case, you can see, you can find links in the show notes. You can always tweet us or hit us up on Instagram. Just search for Invisible Hate Podcast. Thanks again for listening. If you like what you hear, please share with a friend. Invisible Hate is a joint production of Rafaelion Media and Immigrantly. We'd like to thank our team, which includes Michaela Strather, Emmanuel Monahan, Lindsay Gamble, and Purma Chakravarti, who does our amazing sound design and editing for the podcast. Our theme music is done by Simon Hutchinson. We are going to be off next week for 4th of July, but we'll be back the week after that <laughs> for another hate crime for us to analyze. Until then, I'm Asad Bhatt. And I'm Sadia Khan. Take care. Take care.